he's not asleep. Oh, <laughs> he was asleep. Hopefully he won't bother us too much. Hey guys, finally I've got around to making some actual content, an actual video that isn't just me saying hey or a uh, gameplay footage from the game and stuff. But it is to do with the game. I wanted to show you the progression of first starting on Unity because it's a software that I'd never touched before all the way to where I've got with the game so far and maybe even where I want to go with it. A couple of things though before I do start is I never intended to make this video like a few months back when I started making a polyclip po a polyclips <laughs> words it's been a while forgive me so there isn't much uh, coding footage because I never really tried to record anything. Uh, the only time that I did really press the record button was after I completed a little milestone and just wanted to keep a little memory of oh I got this working, oh I got that working and it looks like it's come in handy because I can use it for this video. Uh, secondly the footage that I did take I never checked my OBS settings so I had some settings wrong and it can be a little bit low quality shall we say rather like my webcam which I haven't upgraded for like seven years. Nevertheless let's get on with it. Stop licking. Oi. You. Dog. Oi. Obedient, huh? Pause. Oi. He's licking. Stop licking. Why is he licking for? Do I need to blur this? I'll probably blur it. <laughs> anyway, the first thing that I done when learning a new software was to research it a little bit. I had a few different uh, game engines that I wanted to have a look at and after going through Unreal and Godot and there's a couple of other ones, I settled on Unity because it done exactly what I needed it to do and seemed to be pretty flexible and, and beginner friendly which is important. But I didn't know how to use it so I jumped on Udemy and it was sort of a bit of a stab in the dark really. I, I, I tried looking at YouTube tutorials but YouTube tutorials don't really work for like a across the board kind of thing. YouTube tutorials are great for if there's something that you don't know what to do you can search it and someone would have made a video on it. But starting completely from scratch in a new software, there's no YouTube video that can really show you that. But uh, I found this one that had really good reviews and I bought it. And the first time that I went through it, I got about halfway through and then my mind sort of melted and I got a bit confused with everything and a bit burnt out, so I left it. But I didn't fully leave Unity, I just sort of played with it myself a little bit and, and got more used to it and then a couple of months later I went back to the Udemy course and I started it again. I was like I know this first like three or four um, I don't know what they call them courses whatever you know lectures that's what they're called they're really easy but I'll just do them again anyway I'll just get my head back into it and it really helped going back through all again everything just sort of clicked a little bit better I don't know if it was because I'd used unity a little bit by then or I'd already done it but the second time through the course really helped and I managed to get all the way through and by the end of it I understood most of what I needed to do he's gone he's back okay I heard you ah, okay he's gone no more doggy distractions so after making a few test projects and trying and failing at a lot of things, I wanted to make Purple Helmet but in 3D, you know, that little 2D game that we made. And I think eventually at one point I will go back to it and make a, a 3D Banjo and Kazooie Super Mario World 3D-esque style game but with the, my Purple Helmet characters that I'd, I'd made back for the, uh, the, the mobile game. So after 20 or 30 failed projects for varying reasons, uh, this is the earliest footage of what I would say was the birth of a polyclip. It wasn't even meant to be a first person shooter. This world that we're in right now is actually uh, from the tank game that I had had and I was just got a bit bored and frustrated uh, so I just put a little first person controller <laughs> on, a, on a character and was just wandering around the world seeing it from a different perspective perspective uh, but I actually liked it I liked seeing it low down I've always been a huge fan of uh, of first person games like Skyrim and Call of Duties and all these kind of things I always feel more immersed in first person than I do in any other kind of game so uh, the first person controller that I'm using here was made by a guy called Colin Derp. you can find him on YouTube I might even put a link in the description uh, his first person controller was really great for beginners it, it had everything that I sort of needed it to do and was easy to expand upon and he doesn't care what you use it for you can use it for your own games and it's easy to modify and perfect so there was my start 
Once I was happy with uh, shooting a <laughs> polygun around, I needed some AI. And the first time that I got a little soldier to run around a corner at me, it scared the life out of me. But I was happy. I had got my first AI moving. And of course, obviously, once something can run at you and you're holding a weapon, you want to be able to shoot it. So the next thing I had to learn was how I can kill something. And then I ran into quite the problem. Uh, getting a, a simple Call of Duty style bot is very tricky. Now, ideally, you know, you, you want him to go behind cover and you want to look at the correct direction at you and you want him to aim and shoot and not be like laser accurate and and it turns out that there's a lot of things outside my skill range yet so a rethink was needed i liked the first person shooter idea but i didn't know how to get something to shoot back at me uh, after a few workarounds a revelation hit me zombies Zombies don't need to shoot back. <laughs> Zombies just run after you. And that bit, I can do. I can make something run after me. Ha ha. I have a zombie. They could be slow. I can make that. They could be fast. I can do that. They don't carry weapons all that often. And I think that is when a polyclipse was born. The idea itself. It was no longer a little test thing in another world. It was its own, its own entity. So I had the first person controller and I was able to run around and I had what the beginnings of a bit of a zombie AI but I had no world to put it in. Now I'm not a 3D modeler, I've used Blender a little bit, I've never touched Cinema 4D and, and these other ones but uh, 3D modeling takes a lot of time, you know, even for a very simple map, you know, you need to model a building, you need to model some fences, you need to model some trees and maybe a couple of little flowers on the floor, some props like wheelie bins or you know trash bins and and weapons and frying pans and and fuel stations and vehicles and very quickly you can spend months just making things and not getting anywhere i think that's the one of the troubles i had with my purple helmet game i wanted to make a 3d version of my 2d purple helmet game so i was modeling all the pieces for it and like after like five or six weeks of modeling the game hadn't got anywhere um, so I wanted to get things moving and I think an asset pack would work really well for that. So Cinti Studios came to my rescue. I went onto Cinti Studios website and the World War II pack was great for my World War II game and they have a uh, apocalypse pack for zombies. It's got zombie models in it. It's got all the buildings you'd need. It's got all the weapons you'd need. It's all modular so you can make your own things out of them all. They uh, fit with other Cinti packs as well and I had a few other Cinti packs that I, I purchased before just to play around with. Ideal. I've now got a controller, the start of an AI and the ability to make a world. Another trap that I always would fall into with previous projects was a lack of planning. I was just sort of winging it. <laughs> as I went, uh, I needed some kind of, of, of plan that I can follow a progression towards a core game loop. Uh, Trello was my answer to that. It was somewhere, a website that you can use is free to use. And uh, it's basically like a screen that you could just stick a load of sticky notes on is, is what Trello is. There's a few different options out there, but Trello works well for me. I can make new things. I can take old things off and archive them that I don't want. I can change the colors of bits to signify different things. It just works very well for organizing. The zombies themselves actually started their life a lot more complicated than they are at the moment in the code. They would uh, wander around very slowly if no one was nearby and groups of zombies would migrate with, uh, with other groups to make them bigger. They could even be uh, attracted to gunshots and noise and stuff. And that was the moment when I caught myself from nearly making the same mistake as what I had done in every other project prior. My scope was too big. I was dreaming of this open world, sneaking around zombies, looting buildings and crafting materials. And it's so easy to get caught up in all that, but you never end up getting anywhere with it. You sort of work on all of the features all at the same time and, and none of them really work how you want them to. And they're never really fleshed out properly. So you get frustrated and bored and then you scrap the idea and start again. I wasn't going to do that this time. I needed to think about my core game loop. What was the minimum thing that I wanted my game to do? Well, 
I wanted to shoot zombies. I wanted it to get harder as it goes on. I wanted to be able to win at some point or lose and get that working. Get a working prototype and then if my ideas from there don't work, I can always fall back onto this working version. So with the open world idea out of the window, I need to think about map sizes. Uh, a map too small is boring, but a map too big is going to cause performance issues on the computer. And I'm still new to it all, so optimization isn't something that I know too much about. I needed a sort of medium size, something that you can run around in and you've got room to, to move in, but also always under pressure. That was the, the idea of the game, is, is you're never safe. You've always, you've always got to be on the lookout. So the first map I made was a, a simple trailer park map. I actually enjoy making maps, thinking about the routes the player's going to take and the shortcuts that they can do, where the zombies are going to come from and how they're going to navigate around, how much room that they need between objects to be able to get through them. Level design is tricky, but it's really fun to do. Next was something that I probably should have seen coming sooner. You see, I was using Unity's NavMesh agents to control the zombie AI. It's a very powerful tool, but this drawback is making things jump with it is tricky. It's possible, but it's tricky. Unfortunately for me, zombies don't jump. Not, not all that often, but the trouble is the player can. You could jump just high enough to get onto little boxes and, and little props around the place. Now, using that, I could get out of the map really easily. I could get on top of the trailers. I could get out of areas of where I'm supposed to get and where the AI can't follow. I saw my options as follows. Either carefully and painstakingly design all of the maps not to allow the player to escape. Or I could put invisible walls in areas like how Call of Duty maps work so you, you can't get out. The only trouble with that is I can still jump onto little boxes and climb out and people are very clever. You know, I, if I can get myself to a spot where the zombies can't get me, then anybody else playing the game is also going to very quickly be able to do that. So my third option is to remove the player's ability to jump altogether. That puts the player and the AI on an even playing field. Suddenly, anything that you can do, the AI can also do. So you can design the maps in a way that, as long as you can get up there, you know the AI will be able to. Okay, so it's not the perfect solution. You know, there are still today in the game areas like on top of a washing machine or if you carefully position yourself on top of a car well enough, uh, the zombies can't actually get to you. But it doesn't give you any kind of advantage because as soon as you run out of ammo, that's it, you're stuck. <laughs> so you have to get off where you are anyway to go and refill more ammo and by then enough zombies have congregated around you that you can't escape. So the idea works, the solution worked. After that, I gave the UI a bit of love and added a pause state. I should have definitely added a pause state, even a very basic one, way earlier. Being able to pause the game is so handy while testing. <laughs> so the game functions, but I've got no menu screen. I'm not going to be able to change any settings. There's no title screen, so it sort of just jumps you straight into the game immediately. There's not even a loading screen or a countdown. I need to work on that a little bit. I decided to put my menu screen inside of the player's RV. You see it on every map and the ammo box is always next to it. I imagine it's what's used to get the player between all of the locations. It's smoky and a bit broken, but it runs in, in the Apolyclips. A vehicle that runs is very important. I filled the RV with weapons and equipment that this imaginary character is collected over time. I also had a lot of fun making a, a bit of a janky cutscene that plays at the beginning when you load up the, the game. Uh, the zombies are completely randomised every time that you play it so it's different and they just chase after the RV. It was a fun little sort of break and working with the timeline feature of Unity. And with that in place, it was time to do my first proper build. The game works. In its most basic form, the core gameplay loop was complete. Options are always handy to have in a game and I'd never made an options menu I don't think really in, in any game at all. So it was fun to do and Unity makes things quite easy to, to, to figure out. I had to play around with audio mixes and thinking about the UI anchor points for when the resolution of the screen gets changed. 
uh, even with a, a mobile-ish kind of resolution, the game works. The game looked all right. It didn't have too much peripheral vision, but maybe at one point I could make a mobile version of this thing and it wouldn't look too bad. Next on the agenda was some weapons. So far, I only had the one assault rifle and it was probably a little bit too overpowered. Probably is still today, maybe a little bit too overpowered. It's been tuned down a lot and the animations have been tweaked and changed, <laughs> but I needed more. The second gun that I made was a nail gun, which I called the Crucifier. I had to make all the animations myself. I had to find the sounds and, and or make the sounds even for some of them myself. Uh, but after a while, I had 10 weapons. They're all a little bit different. They're all a little bit different sort of handling and types and strengths and weaknesses and ammo amounts. It was a good variety. So now I've got all of these weapons, I now need some more maps to play on. So Junkyard was the uh, second location. Unlike the trailer park map, this one had elevated areas using ramps that were just shallow enough for the AI and for the player to be able to run up without looking too weird. And it gave the level a, a bit of a different perspective. You could see things from different angles and you could get away from the zombies a little bit better because you can jump off the edge or you know fall off the edge. Uh, but the zombies can't, and I, I like the balance of that, of, of, you know, you can just sort of juke them and get to your ammo box a little bit easier if you sort of lure the zombies away and up to an area first. Then once the junkyard map was done, I moved on to the third map, which was the, uh, the church map. This has a feature on the map that you'll have to look out for. I'm not going to say it here. It's not a secret, but I'm not going to talk about it on the video. You just have to play that level and try and find the, the feature of that map out yourself. So, three maps, ten weapons, and a fun gameplay loop. Sounds to me like it was ready for some testing, but finding people to test and try out a game isn't as easy as you might think. I'm lucky enough to have you guys, and I thought maybe some of you might want to check it out. I hadn't uploaded to this channel in nearly a year, so I was a bit nervous, but I was surprised at the response I got. So with the game uploaded to Itch and the trailer live on my channel, it was a little bit nerve-wracking. You know, I had been the only person to really play this game and test it. What if I'd missed something silly or forgot to change something that I was supposed to before building it? What if it doesn't run on other people's computers? You know, I pre-tested it on a few other computers that I have laying around at mine, but it's not exactly a large sample size. Fortunately, nobody seemed to have any of those kind of issues, and at the time of editing this video, the game's got over 300 downloads in, in not all that long, so I am overwhelmed and far surpassed all of my expectations. I mean, I would have been happy with 10 downloads as long as the people who did download it at least enjoyed a little bit of it. I got great comments from the, the games page and from you guys here on YouTube, and uh, none of you have seemed to hate it, which is, which is always nice. I was actually already working on the next update for Apocalypse before the game had actually gone live. I have a, a good plan now of progression for the game. My Trello board has been well updated and, and, and kept uh, in, in organized fashion. And I've even got a, a roadmap on the game's homepage of future updates of what I plan to include in those updates. I don't really know how far I'm going to go with the game. I have updates in my head that go way beyond what I have written down on the on the homepage or even on my Trello board. I think having a game on Steam for sale does sound pretty fun. I don't bother me if no one buys it. I don't care about that. But just having a game on Steam just sounds a bit of a, an achievement. I haven't fully looked into Steam. It seems both very simple but also very complicated at the same time, which is weird. Um, maybe someone in the comment section has done it before. Maybe someone can help me out with it. Uh, but for the moment, it's on Itch. It's free on Itch, and I'll be updating it on Itch for free, and you just download it from there. But anyway, I have been rambling for way too long now. I want to get back to my game and carry on testing it <laughs> and making some more features. I'll leave any helpful links and stuff in the description below that I found helpful. Um, I'll leave a link to the Udemy course. I'll leave a link to Cinti Studios. I'll leave a link to the first person controller uh, that I used. So yeah, check out the description. There'll be some stuff in there that you might find handy. Uh, but yeah, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like. Feel free to subscribe and all that business. And I shall see you in the next video. Bye!